All right. Good morning. <laughs> morning. Uh, we'll kick it off, Bob, with just a, a general question about, you know, where do you think, we're, before getting into technologies, where do you think the industry ha has been with respect to the progress that they've made in areas of unmet need and cancer and cardiovascular, and we can talk about, you know, technologies and, and, and the role that plays in the Sure. In the well, I think, Jeff, the first thing I would observe is that we're uh, in a phenomenal era of innovation. and. You know, we see it every day now as the pace of understanding of uh, biology just seems to continue to accelerate. So I think that, you know, the, the good news is that this is, um, you know, a golden moment for those that are interested in innovating and trying to solve problems that have long seemed intractable, whether in cancer or cardiovascular disease or other diseases. Uh, and I think the other uh, piece of good news is that it's coming out of a uh, propitious moment in time. When you look at the uh, demographics of the globe, we live in an increasingly aging society, and unfortunately, as people age, uh, they become uh, more and more at risk to diseases of the aging process, and in particular, in that context, cardiovascular disease and cancer. So, uh, great innovation, important moment in time for that innovation to flourish, uh, and again, fingers are crossed uh, that across a range of different uh, technologies, we should see advances in the fields for both of these diseases. And a specific question for Amgen, you guys a couple of years ago did the Micromet deal, which I think brought a, a platform technology in-house and then it grew the pipeline in a, in a pretty expansive way. Maybe just talk about the, you know, the lessons learned from that, Bob, and, and, sure. and how Amgen uses you know, platform technologies, uh, some that have been proven, some that are a little you know, leading edge to, uh, to, to discover and to develop these pockets you know, that, of, of newer therapies. Sure, and uh, Jeff is obviously very familiar with um, our Micromet technology, which, uh, as he said, came from an acquisition now uh, several years ago. But the, uh, the idea behind Micromet was the idea that we could, in a way, you might think of it as a bridge between, uh, or, or bridge to cell therapy. So uh, Micromet uh, unleashed a, a suite of what we call bispecific T-cell engaging uh, molecules. And so the notion is that at one end of the molecule, we bind a, a cell of interest. So for example, we bind CD19 for those patients that suffer from acute lymphoblastic leukemia, in particular, relapsed refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We're able to bind the CD19 on one end of the molecule, and then on the other end of the molecule, bind CD3 on T cells. And uh, as that molecule brings those two cells into close approximation with one another, uh, synapse is formed and the T cell does what T cells do so very well, uh, it kills the cancer cells. And so we saw that as uh, an exciting opportunity uh, to bring to not just liquid tumors, but ultimately we hope solid tumors as well. Uh, but again, the idea was that this is something of a bridge. It's, uh, it's a technology that has proven tractable, that is working. We have um, the great uh, opportunity with a molecule called Blincido for which we've demonstrated overall survival advantage versus standard of care. So it's a molecule that's been approved across uh, countries around the world and is making a difference for patients now uh, with that disease every day. Uh, and we have an opportunity to try to replicate that success in other disease settings as well. You know, the big hope has been, as it is for, for CAR-T therapies, the big hope has been that we'll be able to demonstrate progress or success in solid tumors. Uh, and as those who follow us closely, and certainly Jeff is amongst those, know uh, we've demonstrated what we think are some promising data in prostate cancer as well as in small cell lung cancer uh, by going after antigens that are expressed, if not exclusively, um, disproportionately on uh, disease cells. So we have uh, four programs in prostate cancer that we're very excited about. Uh, as well as a, a program that's moving very rapidly in small cell lung cancer. And I think if we're able to demonstrate uh, that these are safe and effective and register these molecules, that will be a big moment for the field. And you know, in, in some ways, it helps illustrate um, one of the challenges with, with cellular therapy. And cellular therapy, as the, as the previous panelists mentioned, is expensive. Uh, and it's also time consuming from a patient perspective. So the beauty of something like the Micromet platform is that we can move very quickly, it's much more cost effective, uh, and you know, we hope it will enable us to treat patients for whom uh, uh, current cell therapies may be a bridge too far. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, the role of cell therapies uh, um, going forward. So is this a, a significant priority for Amgen to also address 
uh, areas of unmet need using, using those cell therapies? What, what, what inning, I guess, do you think we're in um, with respect to using technology to address these big unmet needs, and, and how does Amgen fit in that, in that spectrum? I think in the long term, we would say we think the prospects are promising, but in the short to medium, there are still some challenges that need to be worked through. So I've alluded to you know, one of the challenges, which is cost. Another is the time to, to create these therapies for patients that are uh, uh, seriously ill. Um, and so, you know, we think there are still some hurdles that need to be cleared before this will have the kind of widespread uh, use that we think we can achieve, for example, with our bi-specific T-cell engaging uh, uh, pro programs. So long-term promising for sure. You know, we have um, had a number of collaborations through time uh, with innovators in the area of cellular therapy. We continue to invest in that space, primarily in early stage technologies and primarily through our venture uh, investing arm. Uh, but we, and I think all the other major players in our industry, will continue to watch closely uh, and see as the data emerge whether the time is ripe to bring these on in a more uh, comprehensive way than we have thus far. Right. So obviously watching closely the NK you know, cellular developments, uh, we have some investments in that area as well. And this looks like it'll be an interesting year for those that are uh, encouraged about the prospects of uh, natural killer cells in the fight against cancer, for example. Right, right. Well, when you think about major you know, unmet needs, and in today's session we're talking about you know, cardiovascular and, and, um, and, and oncology in particular, but you know, over the course of the pandemic, for example, we've seen a lot of disruptions to care um, that you know, have really been, you know, it, it's, it's hurt a lot of companies in the industry, but I think we're transitioning now to a more of an endemic normal phase. But, Help us with kind of where you, what, what the scorecard do you think the industry has and, and maybe how Amgen has kind of met those challenges of, of responding to a pretty significant disruption over the past couple of years. Yeah, uh, I hope you're right uh, that we're transitioning back to normal, um, but it does feel like, like we are. And this has, again, been an extraordinary period uh, for the industry. I think that one day we'll be able to look back and recognize what an incredible accomplishment it was to have so many different approaches to battling this pandemic emerge as quickly as they did. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, the vaccines and, and what a blessing it was that we had several vaccine therapies available as quickly as we did and that those vaccines were as effective as they've proven to be. But in addition, there were a number of other uh, important uh, technologies that advanced to help in the fight. We were associated, for example, uh, Jeff, as you know, with the production of, of antibodies uh, that can be used for those that are infected. Um, there are other therapeutic antibodies as well that have helped make a difference in the fight. The antiviral therapies, I think, are you know, still at an early stage, but demonstrating um, great promise as well for being able to wrestle, finally, wrestle the ground this pandemic. So it's been an incredible window uh, for all of us in the industry, and I hope all of you share that um, enthusiasm for what was accomplished as well. But certainly, I, I think when we have the chance to step back and look historically uh, at what happened here, we'll recognize this was a pretty special moment in time and a moment that underlines just how profound the uh, spread of knowledge uh, in biology is right now and how rapidly we can harness that spread of knowledge to try and make a difference in these tough diseases. Uh, but, you know, one of the unfortunate things that we have to acknowledge as well is that, you know, as society ground to a halt, the kinds of um, run-of-the-mill interactions between patients and their caregivers also, um, you know, came to, to a halt. So the kinds of uh, diagnoses for cancer that might otherwise have happened at, a disease, at the disease's early stage um, you know, ha are now happening a year or two, late, or, or two later than what might have otherwise been possible. And as I think all of us can appreciate, uh, you know, a cancer diagnosis two years earlier is better than a cancer diagnosis two years later. Uh, and so we need, I think, to uh, redouble our efforts to catch up on those missed visits. And it's not just, it's not just cancer, it's cardiovascular disease as well. And I think there's abundant evidence, and we look forward to adding to that evidence, uh, that you know, the earlier you start therapy to prevent, for example, the development of atherosclerotic disease, the better. And so, you know, unfortunately, we think there's a little bit of a public health or a chronic disease crisis that's been welling up behind the pandemic uh, that we need to now get on top of as a society and as a community of, of innovators. So we remain very focused on the fact that heart disease, heart attacks and stroke, strokes are the leading killers of people uh, in the world. Uh, that was true throughout the pandemic and it will be true, unfortunately, emerging from the pandemic. 
Uh, and there are therapies uh, like those that we have that, that are both on the market and in the clinic that we think can significantly prevent uh, heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and we need to do uh, our job and prescribers need to do their jobs in educating payers and educating patients about the importance of getting in front of and, and preventing things that we know we can prevent. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. And, and uh, again, I think the pandemic made that challenge uh, more real and, and more substantial for all of us. Yeah. And, and um, going into the, to the pandemic, you know, Amgen has, has um, increasingly had a, a, a model of, you know, a, a, of increased efficiency with respect to, uh, you know, to R&D. So a lot of targets, a lot of studies. Um, help us, you know, Bob, with, with how you see that going forward. What, what sort of pockets do you think that are still our areas of, of, to, to leverage uh, to help maximize, you know, the number of opportunities uh, that you may have in your pipeline and, and to address some of the, you know, the bigger needs? Well, our, our focus for much of the last decade has been on trying to have an understanding of a genetic the genetic basis for disease. And so we've made a significant investment in human genetics, and we've expanded that now to include other uh, human data, uh, proteomic data, for example, uh, transcriptomic data, and, and a variety of different uh, sets of data that we think we can use to better understand disease and, and thus to better understand how our medicines interact and prevent and hopefully uh, improve uh, disease outcomes. So we start there, Jeff, with, a, with the idea that we want to have a high conviction at the beginning of a journey that our intervention is going to work. Uh, and that's based on you know, decades of experience in our industry, which shows that the preclinical animal models just aren't good enough. And that's why, you know, one in 10 medicines that enter human clinical trials uh, fail. Uh, and they fail because the preclinical models that we have just aren't good enough. So we hope that by using genetic, human genetic data uh, at the outset, uh, we can uh, turn the table in our favor and have better chance of, uh, of achieving results that matter at the end of our clinical experiments. So we start there and, and we try to focus on the areas where there's huge unmet medical need today. Uh, and then uh, having identified uh, that, we try to figure out what's the modality that makes most sense. And, and we're willing to consider a broad range of modalities. Um, we're not yet uh, actively engaged in, in gene therapy, but we're paying close attention to those who are uh, watching and, and investing uh, in the space. Uh, but we're more predominantly looking at uh, uh, modalities that have been already validated and that we think can apply to the needs of large patient populations uh, where the diseases that we're focused on uh, are, uh, are relevant. So, for example, as Jeff knows, we have a, a molecule in mid-stage clinical development against LP little a, which some of you in the audience will recognize as one of the remaining risk factors that's, that's not modifiable by diet or exercise or other therapies that are available and approved already today. So it's a, a therapy that's intended for those people who are born with a high risk of developing atherosclerotic disease and having early uh, uh, heart disease uh, in their lives because they have this high level of, of LP little a that they were uh, born with a predilection for. And so we have a, um, an RNA-based therapy that we're advancing and very excited about uh, that we think might meet a sweet spot uh, in uh, the world of heart disease for those particular sets of patients. And that's how we try to progress, Jeff. We try to, again, start with a, a, a conviction that we understand the biology, that we have reason to believe that our approach to that biology will work in humans. Uh, we try to find diseases where the unmet medical need is high, where we think we can um, bring forward a big effect size. Um, and, and then we you know, proceed with the kind of expensive you know, uh, clinical trials that are required to get approval and to try to uh, meet the needs of patients. We talked about this earlier, but you know, I know this session is on cardiovascular and, and, and oncology, but in areas like CNS, where there has been you know, less of a um, disruption uh, of, of newer therapies, um, what is Amgen's view of, of areas like that that are, you know, that, that in, in theory are, are tougher and have a longer you know, kind of uh, a period of, of, of not a lot of, you know, significant innovation. Yeah, well, there's a huge global need for more innovation in the area of CNS and in particular neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and so um, we have, uh, we, we spun out uh, our neuroscience research unit um, together with uh, some of the work that we do in human genetics uh, to try to, again, continue to advance the discovery research 
um, ideas through our um, use of human genetics. Um, our hope is that we will find a window to get back into neuroscience uh, down the road. Uh, but I think there are a couple of fundamental things that have to happen in order for us to feel like we can make a, uh, a significant contribution there. And, and maybe the most important of those things is being able to get across the blood-brain barrier um, uh, well enough to, to get therapies uh, where they're needed in the brain. And again, to get them at an early enough stage in the progress of the disease there that we can make a difference. And, and when we concluded a couple of years ago that, that we just, we were too far away from a point of having medicines that can make a difference in the world, um, you know, we, we, we felt that uh, it was probably better off in the hands of some early stage investors who could um, uh, continue to push it along over a couple decades. And so that's where we are. And again, I think if we're, if we're lucky enough to see either gene or cell or other therapies that help get uh, medicines across the blood-brain barrier, we'll look at, at whether we can re-enter and, and make a difference. In, in the field of, of oncology, Amgen has just had a, a recent launch in Lumacras, and you know, it requires a diagnostic uh, um, in the case of a, a G12C mutation. But using that as an example, Bob, you know, how, how do you think Amgen has sort of improved the visibility and the continuum of care uh, in an area like, say, oncology, where you, you, know, you go from sort of bench to bedside, and yeah. there are lots of improvements along the process to how you can you know, maximize that. Yeah, well, that's a big, important question. Let me just perhaps say a word about the, the therapy that you mentioned, Jeff, Lumacras, which is our drug that was approved for non-small cell lung cancer patients who uh, have a mutation known as a KRAS G12C. A mutation. And for those that are active in the field, you'll recognize that um, that, that oncogene associated with KRAS G12C was um, known and identified very early in the oncogene journey, uh, more than four decades ago. In fact, it was recognized as a driver of uh, these types of cancers. And for four decades, researchers tried to design molecules that might uh, interrupt the signaling that occurs uh, in those uh, mutated cancers, but to, to, to no avail. Um, and we were able, um, over about a four and a half year journey, moving as fast or fast, faster, uh, considerably faster than we ever have before, to demonstrate that we had a molecule that was safe and effective uh, at addressing the needs of uh, patients with that particular mutation. So that was an exciting uh, uh, breakthrough for us because, again, it represented what had been a broad quest in the industry for, for many decades, um, and it represented a real breakthrough for patients that suffer from that very specific molecular defect uh, in their non-small cell lung cancer. But increasingly, I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see um, a need to understand cancer you know, at the molecular level and try to understand what therapies are most well-suited to uh, aberrations you know, at, that, at that level. And, um, Lumacress is an example. There are now a number of others in the field as well. But what they have in common is the need to, to have that, um, you know, that molecular diagnostic understanding. And it, that starts with you know, needing that you know, for in, in the clinical trial process, but then also needing it actually in clinical practice. So what role have we played? We've been very successful in, in getting ascertainment of G12C KRAS status up front for non-small cell lung cancer patients. I think we're seeing now approximately 80% of patients that have a non-small cell lung cancer diagnosis uh, are being tested to see whether they are a G12C mutant or not. And obviously those who are are, are um, uh, potential patients for treatment with our medicine Lumacras. Uh, but the key now is not just in making sure that physicians get that diagnosis at, uh, at the initial discovery of the cancer, but now that, that diagnosis is available when patients progress. So, for example, many patients go on to frontline therapy today, um, uh, and they begin that journey uh, with knowledge of whether the patient is a G12C mutant or not, but by the time they progress and need to go to second line therapy, that diagnosis has been lost or it's not traveling with the patient. Uh, and what we need to do, in fact, it's something like fewer than half of the patients who advance the second line uh, are, are doing so with their electronic medical rep records capturing whether they have that actionable mutation or not. So we, and I think the hospitals and the physicians who are treating these patients are gonna have to do a better job of making sure that we get from 50% to darn near 100% knowledge of whether these patients um, uh, can be treated with a G12C inhibitor like, uh, like ours or not. 
uh, because, again, the, the innovation is there, uh, and shame on us if we allow the failure of the technology inside the clinics or the hospitals uh, to alert the, the physician that the appropriate um, mutation is present and that, therefore, an inhibitor of that mutation is an appropriate next step. So more work to do still. But uh, you know, the good news is that uh, increasingly, I think, uh, the idea of having a you know, molecular profile of cancer is being more well understood. And the technologies for doing that, including liquid um, you know, bio, uh, biopsies as opposed to having to always have tissue-based specimens, is becoming more widely accepted with regulators and I think with clinicians as well. And just along those lines, you know, just uh, um, following on the, the comment you made on, on Lumacrest, and so the next step is to, you know, is to, to show us data um, and improve, you know, combination therapies, right? So to move the ball along, to not just in lung, but in other tumor types. So, you know, help us with kind of the methodology of how Amgen looks at a foundational therapy like Lumacrest and then moves the ball across the board to many other tumor types and, and, and different modalities and mechanisms? Well, our, our first question is, uh, is uh, whether uh, the therapy works across tumors that express um, the KRAS G12C mutation. So while it's most commonly found in non-small cell lung cancer patients, that particular mutation also occurs in pancreatic cancers, it occurs in uh, colorectal cancers, and it occurs in a variety of other uh, solid tumors, and so the question is, will our therapy work across all of those, or is there something uh, about the disease state in the lung that's different from these other um, uh, uh, tumors uh, that are found else, uh, elsewhere in the body? So we're running clinical studies to, to try to answer that question. Uh, we're encouraged so far and have reported some of the data that we've seen in colorectal cancer. We're uh, encouraged as well about what we're seeing in pancreatic cancer. But again, we're running it across a basket of, of all solid tumors for patients that show up in a, uh, in a hospital or in a clinic with a G12C mutation. The next question then is, if we're able to inhibit uh, the signaling pathway downstream of the G12C mutation in the KRAS uh, gene, what are the mechanisms, mechanisms by which the tumor uh, escapes um, uh, that inhibition? And so, you know, we're looking upstream, sideways, downstream, you know, at all the different signaling pathways that are available or open to, to the tumor uh, and trying to figure out how we can preempt uh, signaling uh, in the setting of inhibited KRAS G12C therapy. So, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the science is such that we just have to run those experiments and see which of the different pathways might be most relevant. And we have the broadest program studying this uh, underway now in the field, and we have um, you know, more than uh, two handfuls of combination studies underway now trying to figure out whether we can uh, understand and therefore improve on the treatment of these patients uh, to, to generate you know, truly long-term progression-free or even overall survival for these, for these patients. Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, Bob, you know, Amgen's done you know, a, great, a great job in, in doing internal, um, looking in, internally to, to find new mechanisms and, and new modalities, but also partnering, you know, with, with others. How has that evolved over time? You know, what are you looking for with respect to when you seek out a newer technology or a newer, you know, uh, um, a, a newer asset to, that may be combined with something in-house? Um, we have historically had a, a mix of internal and external innovation, and I think we'll probably have that mix uh, for forever. Um, and you know, it's it's fluctuated around the 50-50 mark. It, you know, at times it's been 60% internal, 40% external, and at times you know the reverse of that. But you know, fundamentally, um, at any moment uh, in which we measure the question, about half of the things that that are in clinical development were originated at Amgen, like. Our Lumacrast molecule for non-small cell lung cancer, an example of in-house Amgen innovation. Um, and, and then half the time, like you know, the Micromet molecules, a number of those came to us uh, from the acquisition of Micromet. So it's a healthy balance of the two. Our focus is to try to identify technologies where we think we have some skill that will be additive to what uh, our partner has. Um, and uh, you know, we try to understand why it is that the field or the patients will benefit from uh, that technology being combined with what we have at Amgen uh, to either move more quickly or, you know, more effectively, um, you know, against the disease. But it starts with wanting it to be well lined up with our stated areas of interest and where we think we have accumulated experience and maybe have a differentiated understanding of what's happening from a biology standpoint. Okay. 
with that, we're, uh, we're out of time, so thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you.